afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, thank you for being here and uh, listening to our story. Uh, my name is Luciana Miranda, and I'm a senior process and applications uh, manager with Celestica. And I basically, my, my team is in charge of deploying inventory optimization strategies throughout the globe for Celestica. One of those uh, uh, applications is smart ops that we're doing, and this is how the, our group was actually formed, right? So we started, I, I've been involved with, uh, with the smart ops uh, deployment all the way from the early days, from the early days of, you know, like Eric said, giving him a few gray hairs by challenging him at every possible corner that I could find. Uh, but obviously I'm here today and uh, Eric won Luch zero, so that's okay. <laughs> Okay, so the agenda today, well, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, I'm gonna to get to the part that Eric uh, stated, which is the global multi-node, multi-enterprise. But before we go there, I'm gonna give you a little bit about Celestica, who we are, our journey, how we actually came about choosing uh, smart ops, as well as in our view, how, what smart ops actually is. So I did not know what time I was gonna present, so obviously that will be a little repetition for, for everybody. So, but at least you'll get to see how what Smart Ops is helped us make the determination and helped us solve the problems we wanted to go after of actually making the, the decision to move forward with Smart Ops. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk all the way from the very beginning of how we started with Smart Ops to where we are today in a, in a very exciting project that we're working through. So let's tell you a little bit about Celestica. So Celestica is, uh, is a global leader in supply chain services. Where we were born, it's actually, we used to be in 1994, Celestica was founded, and we used to be the manufacturer arm of IBM. So our main business was, uh, was actually manufacturing for many, many years and, and continues to be today. We have uh, customers across uh, many of those uh, industries. We build anywhere from computing, communications, consumer, industrial, healthcare, green technology. So the nice thing about that is that it gives us a perspective on different industries, different, uh, different customers, different approaches that allows us to, uh, to benchmark best practices uh, and then obviously give it back to, to, to our customers and internally to, uh, to Celestica. So as I mentioned, our core business continues to be EMS services. However, Celestica is, is it's going through a transformation where we're starting to enter uh, an area of higher value services. And one of those services is uh, supply chain services that we're offering. So one of the things that Celestica's strength or perceived strength is supply chain management. So, and with tools such as Smart Ops, we've been able to, uh, to gain an advantage, we believe, uh, in, in, in offering a, a service to, to our customers that today they don't have. So let me tell you a little bit about our journey. So it wasn't uh, too rosy in 2006. Uh, so Celestica was actually, when you looked at benchmarking us across our different competitors, we actually were not at the top of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the standings. Uh, we were not doing very well in inventory. We were not doing very well in customer satisfaction. And actually, as a company, uh, it, it, there were dark times. So one of the things Celestica did is they said, we have to change. And the changes came through a three-step approach. One was we started treating our suppliers differently. And we started treating them not you know, from a cost per piece, and, and I think if I've heard other customers uh, and other, uh, other colleagues uh, state this, but not just looking at the lowest price per piece, but look at total cost of ownership, right? And that had a significant impact into how we dealt with our suppliers and also into our supply chain services. I mean, I'm sure most of you have experienced like, we got, I got this great price, but now the minimum order quantity is a million, right? So, and, and all of a sudden you buy something and now you have two years worth of supply, great. You just saved yourself a penny. Good job, right? But, I mean, we're human, right? And we actually uh, are motivated by the metrics that are put in front of us. So if we're going to reward people by giving the lowest cost, then guess what you're going to get? Any guesses? Lowest cost, right? Like, I mean, this is not rocket science. The other thing we did is we actually created a lot more visibility. And the visibility through something that we call ring strategy, because flexibility is at the core of what we need to do. Our customers are very demanding. We need to have flexibility in our supply chain. And two ways of doing it, one is inventory, which is expensive. The other way is to try to lower our lead times. So through the ring strategy, ring strategy is, simp is simply a, a methodology of, of viewing all your part numbers by different categories of lead time. So for example, uh, ring one would be anything that we can get within a day. Ring two would be anything that we can get within 14 days and so on as you go through the rings. 
right? So if you have something in ring five, obviously that those are things that have, uh, I believe it's more than 60 days of lead time. Now it's just a visibility uh, tool that, that we created, but then we set targets and metrics around that that helped put focus on it. And it's incredible, you know, when you start putting focus on something, how quickly things change. And the last thing um, was uh, tools and applications that, that we obviously inserted in order to enable our people to do a better job, right? And, and that's where we came in through, uh, you know, through looking at tools such as smart ops in order to say, hey, is there something that smart ops can bring to the table for us to help us to do, uh, give better service to our customers, but also improve our, our cash position. The results from 2006, 2011 were quite significant. Uh, as you can see, our inventory reduction, 36%. Uh, Excess and obsolete reduction, huge uh, anchor weight for us, uh, reduced by 57%. And inventory turns reduced by, um, improved by 32%. Now, I think I heard this many times today, which is, it's very difficult to allocate exactly how much of that 36% was smart ups, right? Because all of a sudden there's like one day of supply and it's like people I didn't even know existed. Come on, it's like, yeah, it was me, it was my project, right? So it's like, wait a minute, no, no, it's my project, right? So uh, a few battle scars from that. But the bottom line is, you know, we're, we're, we're here to do the best thing for the business. And as long as the, as the overall metrics and results are improving, we all win, right? We'll deal the politics of who did what uh, uh, later on. From a supply chain flexibility, uh, we were able to get ring one and two up to 43%. So that's about 16,000. Uh, SKUs that we were able to get in two weeks or less, right? So significant improvement in the flexibility that we're able to give our customers and, and have within our supply chains, which obviously led and had a, it's very much correlated to the, uh, uh, to the improvements in, in inventory that we had. And lastly, total cost of ownership, as I, as I spoke about, you know, you can see here we had a, we, we've experienced a quality increase with our suppliers as well as, as the responsiveness, which again, help us be more, more, fle uh, more flexible. So here's, you know, for the new customers, I think you might get some value for the old customers. I'm seeing uh, some colleagues here. Uh, this will be a repetition uh, for the uh, guys that have been around. You know, I'm pretty proud. I think I, I've been able to explain uh, MIPO in two slides. So that's uh, down from 15 originally. So, so what is uh, soft, you know, for us, what was uh, smart ops, right? So it's basically a tool designed to calculate optimal inventory targets. The key is how it does it, right? And it's, it, for us, it's the four steps on how smart ops calculates that really got us and, and, and eventually won us over. First was that it calculates uh, historical forecast accuracy at the point of sale, right? So that's very important because at the time, we were doing our 60 stock analysis in, in two ways. One, very simple, it's like, a part seven days, B parts 14, and C 28. Great, right? Uh, the other way was we would actually measure, you know, and this was the more advanced piece, measure the variability of our sales alone. But the biggest problem I personally always had with that, and we did a Six Sigma project to prove this, was the fact that, you know, why do I need safety stock? I don't need safety stock because I have variable sales. I have safety stock because I can't predict that I have variable sales, right? So to me, it, it would always bother me the fact that, if I actually, let's say my, my, my sales were 10, 40, and 20, but I actually predicted 10, 40, and 20, do I actually need safety stock? No, I don't, right? So that was one of, you know, starting at that point, that was something that was starting to bother us. Problem I had before SmartOps was that to do the type of analysis where you bring forecast accuracy would take us 15 minutes per part using a very advanced tool called Excel. And uh, so that wasn't gonna work. So the fact that they started at that point was very interesting to us. Uh, the other interesting piece was the fact that they applied that error to the future forecast. So another issue that, that we had was the fact that when you look at your historic consumption, you may be consuming at a rate of 1,000 pieces, let's say, but that's not to say that you will continue at a rate of 1,000 pieces. So in a level loading environment, that works, but in an environment such as us, uh, ours, ours in, a, in a very dynamic supply chain, that doesn't work that as well because you don't really, we don't have level loading or, or level demand, right? It goes up, it goes down, as I'm sure you, you guys experience. So the fact that they were able to take this historical forecast accuracy and apply it to the future was something that was of great interest to us. The other thing was the fact that we incorporated the service level at, again, at the point where it matters, right? And the point where it matters was our end customers, right? If one of my feeder sites is late, but the other, the other site is able to basically absorb that, that, the fact that they're late and the customer never sees it, do I really care at the end? Yes, there are some metrics that get hurt and people may potentially get yelled at and so on, 
but really, let's get real, right? Like, does that really matter? No, it doesn't, right? Because the customer's happy and I was able to meet my, my revenue numbers, which is at the end what, you know, when I look at all the metrics, really the more important metric than if I'm perfect, but all of a sudden, it, you know, I miss my customer commitments. And final knockout punch for us was the, the fact that it performs an end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain optimization, right? And this was key because the other three points, probably that powerful tool I talked about, Excel, maybe I can get to it eventually with some gurus. Uh, however, we could not do step number four. And that was key to us because, as, as you know, the outsourced supply chain is getting bigger and bigger. We were having uh, supply chains that expand all the way, you know, from North America to Asia. That's pretty much the norm, right? So it was very, very difficult for us to do this in a timely manner. And I'll speak a little bit later on some of the problems that it helped us uh, resolve. So from a performing and end-to-end -end supply chain optimization, for us, uh, we had um, a distribution center, an integration center, and then you could have, for example, an EMS or, or, or your factory that actually builds and has finished goods, sub-assemblies, and components. And for us, what SmartOS was very key was the fact that looking at that 95%, SmartOS would figure out different ways of achieving that at different costs, as I'm sure you heard throughout the, this, uh, this forum. So different options that lead you to the same service level, right? Really interesting concept. So for example, you see in option one, the cost would be 223,000. And by the way, if there are any statisticians, these numbers are not to scale. So you cannot throw anything at me if, uh, if, if they don't make sense. Uh, it's just to, throw a, to show a point. Option two, 171,000 and option three, 252. If all of them give you 95% service level, which one would you pick? I go for two, right? So. Yeah, I picked two. So that was really, really important to us, right? The fact that it was able to connect our end-to-end -end supply chains that were really integrated. And what we felt gave us a competitive advantage over, over our competitors at that, at that moment in time. So what problem were we trying to solve? I talked a little bit about the problem, and I really like this, uh, this slide. Hopefully, you will too. But basically, the main problems were, one, poor forecast accuracy. Two, long supplier lead times. Three. Information latency, right? I get a forecast at one point, at the point of sale, but by the time it makes it down to the feeder site, I may potentially lose two weeks, at which point the forecast has already completely changed, right? And four, buffer misalignments. Everybody in the supply chain trying to optimize themselves instead of trying to optimize the whole team. So, and, and as well, obviously, poor end-to-end -end visibility. What's the outcome of that? To us, one of the outcome is the wrong inventory mix. So what happens if you have the wrong inventory mix? You get these two nice sy symptoms, which is high inventory levels and poor on-time delivery. And this was something that was key to, to me personally because usually, at least in, in Celestica, we concentrated too much on the symptom, but not so much the cause of the symptom, right? And, and I see that sometimes when, when I go out and work with, with colleagues is that we concentrate a lot on, you know, I have too much inventory, I have... Uh, poor on-time delivery, and I have to address uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to increase my forecast. I'm, you know, but you're not really addressing the root cause as to why you're sick, right? What does that result in? Well, angry management, because you have wor poor working capital, and as such, uh, obviously, that's not a lot of fun. And then the other thing is you have an angry customer, because they're not getting their product when they want it at the order fulfillment lead time that they want it, right? And who's in the middle? us, supply chain people, right? So you can see that the, the guy here on the right, he's a little more experienced because he's already wearing his hard hat. The other two guys, they're a little newer, but uh, they'll learn. So what do they do at that point? At least in our experience, what they would do is expedite, de-expedite, and cancel, right? They would additional, put additional judgments on the forecast, which to me is a problem because we don't, you know, sometimes in supply chain, we don't have the market intelligence. So we need to talk to marketing. We need to make sure that there is cohesiveness between the, 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 uh, the, the different departments before we make any of these adjustments. So that's dangerous. And two, we just force our suppliers to hold more inventory. Hey, you know, if you hold more inventory, then I have more flexibility. But guess what? At the end of the day, if that, doesn't come, if that forecast doesn't come true, guess who owns that inventory? Eventually, it comes back to us, right? So these are the problems that we're trying to solve. Inventory optimization uh, by SmartOps really helped us with this because it addressed the four key points that we thought, you know, directly and indirectly. Forecast accuracy, we saw from that chart I showed you that from a forecast accuracy standpoint, that's the beginning of where they start their calculation from a, a MIPO and demand intelligence modules, which, is our, which are the modules that we, uh, we have at Celestica. Two, long supplier lead times. 
Well, they don't really fix their lead times, but they create something that's very important, which is visibility to these lead times, right? I remember being at a customer and uh, one of our, we, used to, we did reorder points with them and they saw one item had a reorder point of $26 million. And they're like, this is wrong. This, you know, what is this? How could you have $26 million of reorder points? I'm like, where well, your lead time is 160 days. I think the phone was picked up and within five minutes they started a project to find a way to reduce the lead time of that item. Now that wasn't SmartOps that did that, right? But it was the visibility that SmartOps was able to give to us that actually helped us make that, make that new project. Information latency. By connecting the supply chain, so one of the things that I mentioned is that Celestica, we had two different SAP instances, one uh, for North America and Europe and one for Asia that are customized differently. So they don't really like to talk to each other too much, right? So to get the smartest project off the ground, we had to find a way to bring it all together into one area so that the data could co coexist together and be able to, to make the end-to-end -end model. So what ended up happening from there is our inventory targets and our uh, buffer position and our reorder points all got calculated at the same time. So a nice little byproduct was the fact that we were able to take a bite at MRP latencies that we were, uh, we were dealing with. And finally, buffer misalignments. That's the other big, big uh, deal for us that, that this helped us resolve, which was at the time, the different sites would again optimize themselves instead of looking at optimizing the team, right? And the way I look at it is I'm a big soccer fan, is you have your defenders, you know, trying to basically not let any goals in, and that's all they care about. You have the forwards, and all they care about is scoring goals. Well, guess what? The forwards are not going to help the defenders. The defenders are not going to help the forward. What's going to happen is uh, likely you will lose, right? You'll have one part of the team that is happy because if it, you lose by one goal, then, you know, the defenders are like, well, we only gave up one. The forwards are upset. And if you lose 5-4, the forwards are happy because they scored uh, many goals, but guess what, you still lost the game and the defenders are upset. So it doesn't create a good cohesiveness within the team. And again, the goal was, you know, address those symptoms, right? Because obviously, you know, like other people have said uh, that stood here before me, if, you know, when you make the purchasing decision, you have to justify the spend, the expenditure. You know, it's not just like you show up and you're a pretty face and you're like, hey, I want to buy this tool. Sure, here's the money, right? That, I, I thought it worked like that, but I learned it doesn't. So, <laughs> so uh, the bottom line is, you know, we were able to put a, a business case together to show what the impact of, uh, of Smartos was. So how we evaluated it was using those two key points. So what we did is basically we ran a simulation to where we got Smartos through Eric's help and, and his team to basically look at three different customers. Because one of the things too is that there is no such thing as silver bullets, as I'm sure all you guys know. Um, and so we wanted to give them a, a different options of customers. One was a reorder point customer, one was a customer that had outbound hubs, and another customer was a customer that I knew ahead of time was like operating really, really well, and I'm like, I really want to see you guys trying to optimize this. The bottom line was that for customer one and two, we got very positive results, and we were expecting about a 10% reduction in inventory. Uh, we ended up getting about a 14. Uh, and customer three, we didn't get an, an improvement in inventory, but we saw a, a, an improvement in, in, in service. But then what that gave us, and we realized very quickly, is that we could make this decisions of which customer to apply it to with data. To say, hey, if we want to move from 95% service level to 97, it's going to cost $5 million. Do we want to make that decision? Is that worth it? Yes, it is, or no, it isn't, right? But at least you're using it with data, and you start eliminating a little bit of emotion from, uh, from some of these decisions. So let me move right now as to where we are today. So we've been uh, at this again in 2007 is when we first engaged and then we started applying in 2008. And what we've done is we've done single site supply chains implementations, we've done multi-site supply chain implementations. And what very exciting thing that we're doing now, but it may cost me a couple of gray hairs, which is the multi-node, multi-enterprise optimization, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, later on. Now, you can see that change management gets bigger and bigger as you move for, uh, as you move uh, over to, uh, to your right. Uh, that's not a typo. That's because the longer the supply chain and the bigger, the more parties, the more difficult it is. And, and as Peter mentioned in his presentation before, you have different cultures, different people that you know, receive it differently, right? Some, some businesses, the same like as yourself, Peter, we go in and, it, and it's relatively simple. Some business will fight you tooth and nail because, again, that, that powerful tool I mentioned, Excel, they believe can do a, a better job. 
So from a single site supply chain, I'll talk a little bit about an innovation that one of my team members uh, did, uh, which is uh, something really interesting that we thought first we couldn't use SmartOS for, and we're using it and getting very good value for, which is uh, basically applying it to non-bill of materials, non-forecasted items, and even repairs items. So almost to like reverse logistics, right? And you, you, you know, the first thing when we thought this, like, well, that's not really what SmartOps is about. And, 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 and I'm not saying that it is or it isn't. But what we did is, you know, we looked at how those targets were being set. And those targets were being set by looking at historical consumption. And then based on the variability, we would put a reorder point or, or a safety stock level. Well, hold on a second here. If I do that, that's actually like forecasting. So why don't I just create a statistical forecast from those values, put it through SmartOps, see how good my forecast really is, and then tell me what additional safety stock I need to that statistical forecast. So that's what we ended up doing, and, uh, and, and to be honest, we've had some incredible success. Now, the, the amount of value in dollars to this is not huge, but the impact to the customer is, right? And you can see here that we had a, a working capital reduction in this particular supply chains that we're doing of 35%, and shorts went down from like a list of 40 to less than five in our pilot supply chain. And currently, we're actually, this is one of the areas that we're getting the most pull out of, believe it or not. Uh, which is more, more uh, you know, uh, we call it customer focus teams coming to us to say, hey, we really want to take advantage uh, of this, right? So something to consider. Uh, the other major one we did is, is the multi-stage uh, uh, enterprise uh, optimization. Now that's within uh, Celestica, so not yet going to the multi-enterprise multi-node. This is a multi-node. This was a, a deployment that basically was between Toronto and Thailand uh, factories. That was our flagship deployment. Um, over $300 million of, uh, of, of revenue that can be growing close to a billion, I believe, in, in the next year or so. And this is all being managed through smart ops inventory targets. And, and you can see, again, from, uh, from the slides that, that we had some significant improvements there. Um, so needless to say, we've gotten back uh, the return on invested capital that we were looking for, for from smart ops, and it took us about uh, about a year and a half uh, to get that. So again, you know, taking a word from, from you, Peter, you, you know, it's not something that, that, that we got immediately, but definitely sticking through it had some significant advantages. And the other advantage is the fact that now we're playing in a sector that it, we wanted to be in because it, it doesn't make sense, for example, for Celestica to optimize just its inventory because we're in the middle, right? Our point of sale is not really the point of sale. The customer is a little further out. So with Celestica trying to, to basically increase its, uh, its offering and supply, uh, supply chain uh, services, we have a, um, uh, a large telecommunication customer that has hired us to basically do this for them, right? So we've connected, a, again, a multi-enterprise, multi-stage uh, supply chain, different entities, uh, different companies all together. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. We created proactive dashboards that, again, I'll show you that I'm very excited about. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, again, why. It's just keeping you, you know, I got to keep you guys uh, hanging on. Uh, we created end-to-end -end visibility, not just of that single entity or within, you know, multi-levels of entity, but throughout the end-to-end -end supply chain, as, as we defined it. And uh, we also, they had a big problem with uh, MRP latency. So with this new approach, we're actually able to reduce the, their MRP latencies up to 80%. So granted, their, their starting point was really high, but you know, 80% sounds good and it's true, so it works. Um, and we tied demand planning to inventory optimization to demand supply balancing. Because you know, one of the things that I would highly recommend to, to, to everyone and, and, and even our, ourselves as, as we keep moving forward is, is everything is interconnected in supply chain, right? If you do safety stocks without feeding back to demand planning, if demand planning does something without talking to us, then potentially we can trip over each other. So very important that you know, we connect that. And in this deployment, it's one of the pillars of what we're trying to do is to make sure that it, the, you know, the SNOP process, the process of communication is constant and uh, so that adjustments can be made uh, quicker. So this supply chain looks something like this. This is the challenge that they had. Uh, they had uh, service providers, distribution centers, uh, you have the OEM, which is the, uh, the integration center. You have manufacturing facilities, and you have component suppliers. Okay. Problem they had, everybody trying to optimize themselves. Nobody really looking at the end-to-end -end supply chain. What does that lead to? Very poor inventory performance, very poor 
order fulfillment lead time, very poor on time delivery, right? And bottom line is then the company starts suffering and competitors can come in and take business from them. So this is one of the reasons why they hired us. So here's a picture actually of what the supply chain looks, uh, looks like. And I put some bigger pictures at the bottom just so you guys can, uh, can get a, a little bit better visibility of what this is. So what we built is the many distribution centers that they have throughout the world, uh, integration centers that they have throughout the world with uh, EMS companies that work for them to build their product uh, and to some component suppliers, we've integrated all of that together into one model, okay? Now we call that you know, uh, enterprise one and enterprise two because one of them is on books for them inventory, so they actually own the inventory. Two is actually off books, which is actually at their suppliers. So guess where they want to put their inventory? Any guesses? <laughs> yes, off the books, right? The issue that they have and they have to consider, and we all have to consider, is like, it's not that simple. I mean, I can, twist, I can change parameters in SmartHouse or get my team to change parameters in SmartHouse and push all the inventory back. However, there is something called order fulfillment lead time that then comes to bite you, right? So depending on what you want to deliver. So again, change the language from, I want to just move inventory back and keep it in the, in the rock form of component because that's obviously you know, a desirable position to keep it. However, in certain cases you cannot if you want to meet a certain order fulfillment lead time because you run out of lead time between, uh, between the, you know, the extended supply chains that we have, right? So again, the, we call this the Celestica Supply Chain uh, Collaboration Center. And again, understand the demand variability, but not at the points of each one of those nodes, mm -hmm. but at the point of sale. And then get all those safety stocks, buffers, and reorder point built in order to address that variability. Okay, so very, very key concept for us uh, uh, there. So here's one of, the, uh, one of the tools we built, which we call it the Inventory Liability Dashboard. And this is something very near and dear to me because um, I used to be an inventory analyst and I used to do X's and obsolete claims. Not fun, right? I'm like, I went to university to do X's and obsolete claims. Somebody shoot me, right? <laughs> so I'm like, why can't this be done proactively? Like, why do I have to wait until seven months later or potentially two years and then I have to trace back to what cost that order to come in on that date, you know, and, and it's just very, very difficult to do. So this inventory liability dashboard, what it gives you right off the bat is number one, it gives you for, if you're doing the reorder point, it gives you your, R, your ROP system size. It gives you your inventory commitments. How much do you have on hand? How much do you have on order? Good to know. Uh, your inventory performance, um, the uh, reorder point gap, all that is is basically looking at the reorder point has something called a theoretical average. So the gap is the difference between the theoretical average and your actual inventory. It just gives you a, an idea of where you should be theoretically versus where you are in reality. Very interesting point here is the purchase order analysis. So before this, the way we would an, uh, analyze a safety stock, let's say, or, or a reorder point is we would look at the highest values, filter, see what it is, and start going one by one. With this, we can actually, when a forecast is generated, and we actually produce this even before the forecast gets actually loaded. So what we do in the process is, demand planning creates a forecast, which is uh, uh, you know, in the, not loaded into the system, but instead actually put into a what if scenario type environment. The forecast is sent to SmartOps, SmartOps does this calculation, gives us back you know, the safety stocks and reorder points that we need throughout the supply chain. Right? And then we put it through this tool, 